Okay, here we all are. Oh, Peter is also coming in as well. Hello, everybody. Okay, uh, just warning. Uh, it's a nice day today. I've got my window open right here. Uh, who knows what we're going to hear today? Because we've got construction all up and down the street. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember, not this past summer, but the summer before, uh, some houses kind of blew up on our street. Um, I don't know if you remember hearing about it on Woodman Ave. That's where we are. And uh, the houses are, are now finally starting to get rebuilt. And so the vacant lots where the houses were, including one of my old houses or our old house is now gone, but they're being rebuilt. So there'll be all kinds of noise going on, but I don't need the fresh air because it's, uh, it's pretty nice outside. Okay, uh, so we are uh, in our last class today. Uh, the, I think there's what, maybe a week of school left. It might even be at uh, just an emergency. Okay, all right. Um, we've got, I think the end of this week uh, to wrap up. And a couple of you have contacted me regarding uh, a slight extension for the paper, the final paper, which I am good with uh, because uh, April 11th is when I will be drowning in essays from my Fanshawe students. So I may not even have a chance to get to your papers till several days later. And that's kind of the way I look at it. If I could mark everything in one day, I might be a little bit more of a stickler for, for uh, punctu uh, not punctuation, but for uh, deadlines. But in this case, uh, if you need some extra time, just let me know. Uh, a couple of you have already. And uh, so I'm good. I just wanted to let you know. Okay, so um, what I'm hoping we can do here in the first half is have Emily present some of her ideas regarding um, anarchy, anarchism, uh, anarchistic behavior and things like that, and how that's even a word, uh, and how it ties into your your own art project, uh, and then certainly Maxwell, if you have any input as a, as an art uh, person, by all means, and then we can all still participate. Uh, but it's will be, I guess, a bit more informal in the sense that this is just sort of a presentation that you want to kind of get some feedback on. Yeah. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And in the second half, what we'll do is kind of uh, go over the material and certainly any um, sort of last minute final thoughts. Um, you'll probably notice that the readings from the Ken Nab book are towards the very tail end of the SI's career. This is sort of uh, 1968 and shortly after up to 1972. But I also found uh, in this book here, Potlash, which is en français, right there. Uh, this is a collection of essays when De Ball was a member of the Letters International. And there's a, an essay at the very tail end, I mean, literally page 280 out of uh, 290 pages, where the essay, which has never been translated in any of the official uh, textbooks, like the, the Tom Madonna uh, collection or the Ken Nab collection. And it's uh, this essay here, which I found an English translation of. And I find it really fascinating because it kind of sets the agenda. It kind of, um, the mission statements, we'll call them, for the SI are in their infancy at this point. So what I wanted to do was uh, have you take a look at this very early essay, which I think is quite important, but compare that to where they ended up. And see whether they they stayed on track, you know, whether they fulfilled those those mission statements and the ideas that they initially presented to us. Um, if they stayed true to those ideas, or did time and history, uh, you know, uh, force them, we'll say, to to kind of reframe their their perspective, you know, reframe their argument. So we'll take a look at that in the second half. Uh, Paushini, I know we you and I had mentioned in e emails we wanted to go back to the issue of education, uh, which is discussed because. The, um, the, the strikes and the general, you know, the general conditions of May 1968 were very much the result of students. So I'd like to be able to bring that back to the conversation as well. So that's kind of the overview for our class class for today. But the first half of it, I'd like to um, now just stop talking and allow uh, Emily to present some of her ideas um, on anarchy. Yes. Okay, today is one of those days I drank way more coffee than I should have. So um, actually, I don't want to talk for too long because um, both I'm an auditor in this class and I don't want to take up too much space. And also because it's the last class, there's a lot we need to discuss. Mm -hmm. So if we could save the questions just for this time till the end, I think that would allow me to hopefully contain this to 15 minutes. Um, and so we'll have a lot of time at the end to discuss the readings and everything, if that's okay with everyone. Sure. Um, I am going to share my screen. Okay, would you like me to make you the host? Uh, yes, yes, okay. or co-host. So let's go to uh, share screen. 
Whoops, hang on. No, that's me. Just a second. I was I doing moved, it before. <laughs> yeah, I moved two days ago and I have four coffee machines, right? That work in different ways. So the first one I unpacked um, is one that makes extra strong coffee. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like I have a French press, one of those uh -oh. user things. So I so I went for the French press, right? Which I haven't used for a long time. Emily's and, talking um, about I'm coffee. literally like, it's not good, so. There we go. Oh, okay, more. he's got a good presenting costume on too. Make post. <laughs> um, that's also due to moving. I unboxed all my clothing, which has oh, been in boxes. Talking about being a barista. <laughs> um, yeah, and also the warm weather makes me want to really embrace my like 1980s um, obsession. So anyways, um, okay. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna get going here. All right. <sighs> okay, so being at the theory center is funny. And um, I think what I've realized is that I have a few different intellectual projects. I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but I have a sort of um, a project that leans more towards sort of the art side, a project that leans more towards the theoretical side. And I always imagined that I would do this PhD and they would be totally integrated. But I think what I've realized is that there's different areas, you know, and that's okay. And so actually what I'm gonna be talking about today is a sort of area of my research that I haven't really, I mean, I'm always thinking about it, but I haven't really engaged in for a year. And so I'm kind of bringing it back at the end of this year of being, being at the Theory Center, um, both because I think it's very suited to the context of this class, but also um, because I know you guys are gonna have great thoughts kind of in this area because we've been talking about these ideas. Um, for quite a long time. So the first thing I want to do is talk about um, something that I'm very interested in, which is this small a anarchism. But first, the large A. So while the word anarchy or anarchism is used variously, especially coming up in the early modern or just barely pre-modern periods to refer generally and negatively to disorder, chaos, disarray, or uncivility, such as when Hobbes uh, describes the condition of mere nature as anarchy and war, the word becomes used, especially increasingly in the French press, again, as an insult in the 19th century. Um, and so this makes it all the more interesting when Pierre Joseph Proudhon declares in, I believe it's 1840, um, quote, although a firm friend of order, I am in the full force of the term an anarchist. And so this is quite controversial for two reasons, not that he claims this previously negative word um, as a, a, a descriptive term for himself, um, but also the use of the word order there, although a firm friend of order. Um, and so he's both undercutting um, the negative connotations and um, also drawing attention to the fact that there is an organization um, to sort of combat this view of anarchists that we still have, the black coat, carrying the bomb, etc. Um, if we were to have one major critique of these early 18th um, and uh, early 20th century anarchists, it would be that they believe they have a claim on freedom. Um, they really wanna say that they're the ones who have the closest relationship to freedom because of this free grouping of individuals. And so here we have Emma Goldman saying, anarchism stands for the liberation of the human mind. It stands for a social order based on the free grouping of individuals. And while anarchism is unique in being the only political theory, here I'm talking about a white working class history um, that will, uh, set itself up in a way that evades um, hierarchies and the state, and this is critical. Um, it will share a lot of its critique with Marxism, but it will differ um, heavily in tactics. The most evident of these being uh, the tactics involved in abolishing the state. Um, Marxists want, of course, this uh, temporary state and anarchists want nothing to do with this. And this is sort of the original split. But I think the idea that they have a, a sort of capital on freedom is, um, is a is a bad one, a bad idea. And it's actually something Debord will um, critique. So this is the big A anarchist, the sort of framing of yourself as anarchist. And while there's a lot to say here, I um, am gonna skip ahead to the small A because we're trying to keep it to a short presentation here. So I first came across this term in the writing of Saul Newman, his writing on post-anarchism, um, for example. And really what this talks about is the sort of the increasingly large kind of discursive and practical and action-based formations that um, work on anarchist terms, but don't necessarily frame themselves as such and don't need to frame themselves as such. So, you know, self-organizing against the state, working in the extra or a legal, um, these kinds of things, usually um, combining 
protest with some kind of, you know, aesthetic dimension. Um, here you have an example from uh, ACT UP, the, of course, 1980s anti um, or, you know, uh, pro AIDS awareness uh, group doing a die in. And here you have an image from just a few years ago of Black Lives Matter doing a die-in as well. Now, my claim is not that these um, movements need to be called anarchist. In fact, they're doing just great on their own. I think what I believe is that, um, you know, theory needs practice more than practice needs theory. And so I don't think that these practices need to, you know, for example, become aware of themselves as anarchists, as a sort of uh, Marxist strain might claim, must become aware of themselves as proletarians or whatever. Um, what I'm trying to say is that a number of scholars are tracing from around the late 1980s, 2000s, really a turn in global activism and a term that could be described as small a anarchist. Um, David Graeber writes about this as new anarchism. Yeah, Saul Newman writes about this as post anarchism, which I, I don't like the terming post, um, but his writing is quite good. Um, and so this is kind of a loose conglomeration of, um, of ideas. The other way of framing this political philosophy that I wanted to put on the table, which is what I'm very interested in and really working through ongoing at the Theory Center, is really the kind of uh, the breaking down of the word into anarchism. Again, it is used, you know, I haven't found the first usage. This would be a job for me. Um, but it does come up. I mean, the reason I used Hobbes is because it comes up, especially as people are starting to write humanist political philosophy that's separated from religion, right? What can humans do to organize themselves? And so this word anarchy crops up as the sort of evil other at the same time. The reason why I've included this image here is when you think about the word arca, it means a variety of things. So it's Latin and comes from Greek. Um, and we do see it in all Greek philosophical writing, the arca which can mean origin, can mean first principle, can mean form, a la platonic forms. We're really thinking about origin, first principle. What do things start and stem from? What I've learned about philosophy in this year of really engaging with it in a different way for, than before is philosophy is very obsessed with origins. This is something that I didn't realize before. Um, and it has to do with something about the claiming of knowledge and the sort of totalization of knowledge. And so all philosophies have a different arc. But what I find with anarchist political theory is a total askewal of the arc, which is not to say it's like a utopian, we have no origin, but you know, along the lines of working on principles of mutual aid, of working against the state in the context of protest and protest art, there isn't a need to state a common origin. And I find that to be really interesting. There isn't, you know, one kind of oppression that people need to share, or there isn't, you know, one kind of narrative or one kind of history that um, is required to bind people together in these kinds of political associations. They're really based on issues, on aid, on need. And so to me, that has to do with the ARCA. The reason I'm combining it with the Malevich, which is a bit provocative um, because Kazimir Malevich's um, art style, he will call suprematism. This is the era of isms, cubism, whatever, you know, et cetera. Um, and suprematism, of course, is supreme ism. So in a way, this is anti-anarchist. He wants his art style to be the, be the supreme ism. But the reason I really like this image is not because it's like directly uh, reminiscent of the black flag. These are Ukrainian anarchists who were really bad guys. Like really, we don't like the, like slaughtered a lot of people. I just, the, the image of the black flag here is quite poignant. Um, but the other reason I include it is because part of my research is thinking about modernism always. And, you know, Early modern art, um, in a way, will also try to claim that it doesn't have an arca. Here, with the pure black and the pure white, Malevich is trying to, you know, frame himself, I guess, in a new, in a, in a time without an origin, without an origin beyond it. And so, to me, modernism has a lot of interesting connections with sort of anarchist thinking in general, and it's something I'm going to continue to work on. Um, so I just wanted to put all of those things on the table. Oh, the other note is um, Giorgio Agamben, who I read last summer, I was really disturbed and interested by this. And then it's come up so many times this year when he writes that capitalism is also anarchic and we need to understand this to understand capitalism. Now, what does that mean? It means that it also cites itself as being without an origin, which is to say, it's always existed. You see this in Adam Smith. Oh, we've always had these kinds of exchange that basically look like, capitalism and now we're just giving it money and etc. And so Agamben very convincingly in his most recent book called um, Creation and the Work of Art or something like that, it has a green cover. 
Um, I don't have it with me, uh, but um, he writes that we need to understand that capitalism is fundamentally anarchic in order to grapple with what anarchism looks like today, which to me is just so interesting. Hedo Sterl in a lecture she gave um, a few months ago said something similar when she talked about the storming of the German Reichstag uh, recently by far right folks um, and also in the 1980s by far left anti-statist. And her claim is these people look the same. They dress the same, they look the same, what they're doing is the same. And so her question was like, what do we make of that? This is something I'm also thinking through um, because you see it today too. You see the far right libertarians and the far left anarchists looking much the same, doing many of the same things. Um, and so that's something I'm thinking through too. Okay, I'm definitely talking too much. Um, this is focusing on direct action, what I want to talk about today, which is like a primary tactic of anarchist politics. What does it mean? Um, the first use of the word is by Fernand Pelloutier in his uh, journal, The Workers of the World. And it actually doesn't sound super radical when it first uh, crops up. He writes that working conditions, quote, depend more on direct action than on useless appeals to legislative or administrative intervention. So here he's really talking about, you know, that workers should be doing things on their own. But what he's also saying is it's the direct power of the worker that leads to the functioning of the sort of, of the system, if you will. And so it's in an understanding of the direct power of the worker that direct action sort of crops up uh, reciprocally. So this is a bulletin which calls for a general strike in the form of direct action from the workers in Paris, suggesting that no purchases or deliveries um, would be made or delivered after 8 p.m. on the week, and also to only buy goods from those who did not prevent their employees from unionizing. So again, this doesn't sound super radical, um, but this is the origin. There's a whole bunch of interesting writing about direct action, which we couldn't even talk about here. Uh, Voltairine de Clarine, who's an American, um, also early 20th century anarchist, says all co cooperative experiments are essentially direct action, um, which is interesting. And I think as a bunch of uh, critical thinkers, we might uh, question whether anything I do cooperatively is in fact direct. Um, something I'm interested in is how does the word direct function here? I mean, I don't think in 2020, we can talk about the direct um, without a grain of salt. Um, an, uh, one activist organizer quote I really like says, indirect action, you're not a battery, you're a wire. Um, and Emile Pouget, this is one of my favorites in 1904, says there is no specific form of direct action. Some people with a very superficial grasp of things explain it away in terms of an orgy of window breaking. And we still have this today, always the image of the broken glass on media whenever really anything insurrectionary is taking place. Um, he goes on, making do with such a definition of breaking glass would be to take a really narrow view of this exercise. It would be to reduce direct action to a more or less impulsive act. And that would be to engage, uh, sorry, that would be to ignore what it is um, that constitutes its greatest value and to forget that it is the symbolic enactment of workers revolt. Direct action as workers might apply to creative purposes. Um, yeah, so what I really like about this is even in 1904, there's already a recognition of the symbolic uh, dimension of this, which is not to say that the symbolic is some paltry, you know, doubling of the real, but rather is like fundamentally how social formations uh, form uh, the terms on which they exist, etc. So the symbolic is really central. Um, this is just a cheesy IWW graphic of, you know, on the left, you have the guy saying, you know, let's go vote. That's how we change things. Parliamentarism, which they called indirect action. And then on the right, you have direct action. You have the club that says direct action on it, pointing to the factory. Here's the place where you were robbed. So obviously, this kind of uh, early mythology doesn't have that much, hold that much water anymore. We don't have the kind of factory that you can club down in the same way. Just as the word sabotage, um, which is a favorite amongst artists who do this kind of work, which we're moving on to now. Um, also is a kind of mythology that doesn't hold water, but one I like and thought I would introduce just in case you don't know that the word sabotage comes from the sabot, which is the shoe, the literally the wooden shoe that workers would wear and sabotage or sabotage is the idea of throwing the wooden shoe in the machine so it shuts down and you can basically chill all day and not work. Um, we don't have wooden shoes nor machines in such a literal way anymore. Um, but, but we but have wrenches we, we can throw. <laughs> It's, it's true. <laughs> we have, it's we've true. done it before. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely throw things. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, 
I think it's interesting because as I'm thinking about symbolic, as I'm going to call it, direct action or creative approaches to direct action, um, I'm wondering what it looks like to throw the symbolic shoe. That's one of the questions I have. Okay, so I have called this symbolic direct action in the past. I feel like that sounds really bad. I'm like, I'm being recorded and this is going to be on the internet <laughs> forever. I feel like symbolic direct action sounds a little bit childish and I need a better way to phrase it, but this is what I'm calling it right now. Cause we're talking about direct action that is increasingly being launched on aesthetic uh, terms by artists also is a huge part of this. Not that artists haven't always been involved in radical protest. Of course they're at the center frequently, um, but there is, an increase in this kind of work. It's been called creative direct action by, actually you can't track who used it first because it comes very organically out of grassroots activism, um, but David Graeber writes about it. Uh, creative direct action, symbolic direct action, what have you. So I'm gonna throw a few examples, just some of my favorites at you. So this is a work from a group called the October Group, uh, so-called because of the October Revolution in Toronto, made up of a series of artists, including the um, anarchist, uh, what do you call it? Architect, um, Adrian Blackwell. Um, and uh, this is the coolest work ever. So basically what you have is a subway grate on the left. Um, and subway grates, if you know, air comes out of them, right? So what they did is they have these long two by fours that are connected together. And then they use this very like ad hoc plastic material that we, you would use for construction. And they connect it and then they print words on the side. It's a Soviet futurist poem that says, um, to entrust the streets to the greed of developers and to give them alone the right to build is to reduce life to no more than solitary confinement. So brilliant. And so this work is really dealing with the gentrification that's uh, rapidly increasing in 1996. Um, Toronto had one general strike and it was in 1996. I need to mention that. And so this is part of that. Um, and so what these artists did is they connect this all together and they basically walk it in, put it over the subway grate and this thing blows up. So this is something I would call extra legal. Is it illegal? Not really, but probably you could find a way that it is, but we're not really talking about a binary between the law and not the law, right? This is something that kind of exists in that ambiguous space. Somewhere adjacent to the legal, again, there's a lot of writing about a legality. I've been talking about extra legality, but either are relevant. Um, and in the context of the SI, we can really think that of this as an extension of the critique of property and ownership, um, but giving that kind of critique a very plastic, <laughs> literally, get it? A very plastic form. Um, in basic banalities, um, uh, it's written that the appropriation of territory into property, and here I believe they're talking about the uh, I always picture this as being feudal, but you know, the sort of primary uh, accumulation of territory into property is a purely human violence. And I was very interested in this, um, a violence without mediation. I think it's interesting in talking about property to think about this kind of human violence, uh, to think about what that means in the context of basic banalities, but also again, as regards the direct. When we think about direct action in the contemporary period, what seems strange to me is both direct and action have become very nebulous terms. I shouldn't even say have become, because that's very temporally biased, like always have been, right? Always have been complicated terms, but I mean, after post-structuralism and also, um, you know, after globalization, um, these are both uh, complicated. Um, so this is one example of symbolic direct action that I find to be very poignant um, and to connect to the critique of property that the SI launch. Um, here we have some examples that really deal with play. Um, the SI dimension of play, but also this, the, the seriousness or criticality of play, if you will. So here you have a group um, who make inflatable cobblestones. And this is a sort of, sort of goofy play on the uh, reality that in you know, Europe, cobblestones have always been used as these uh, weapons of you know, sort of radical protest of building barricades, et cetera. But here you have a giant plastic one, a shiny one. And what's so great about this is this kind of work always gets a lot of media attention because it's so bizarre, it's so uncanny. And so there's these great shots of this like on the Spanish news. Um, and this was in a time of an uprising in 2008 that really did deal with um, the concerns around the increasing conservatism of the government. Of course, there's the history of the anarchist or the, the, the Spanish Civil War, which was anarchists and Franken 
nationalists. And so it's playing on all of this history. What I love about this is this kind of humor really makes cops mad. Like you see it again and again, this kind of humor, it's just because what do you do with it? There's something very complicated about this kind of work that I find really interesting in the context of protest. Um, you have a Canadian example here. This is called the teddy bear catapult. Um, you know, this kind of work attracts a lot of cranks. And so here you have someone who actually knew how to build a medieval catapult. So they built it um, and filled it with stuffed animals and lobbed them at cops. And also they're dressed humorously as cops themselves. And so what's so great, not just the levels of disguise, um, which also comes up in the SI writing, uh, disguise and clothing as a kind of extension of detourment, like on the body, but you also have, again, humor and violence kind of really rubbing against each other in a way that's very complicated. Um, and of course, the G20 protests were very violent. And so this isn't all, you know, fun and games, but um, it's a very interesting kind of work in an interesting moment. Um, Hakeem Bey, who I will continue citing, even though he fully advocated having sex with children, I do feel like that needs to be a disclaimer. I mean, news alert, if you didn't know, Foucault says exactly the same thing. So until we cancel Foucault, I'm not gonna cancel Hakeem Bey. Anyways, again, I need to remember this is being recorded. Um, he writes about poetic terrorism in this book, which is amazing, uh, Temporary Autonomous Zones. De definitely recommend. Um, where he talks about art sabotage. So here we have a return of sabotage in the context of a, of a chapter to do with what he calls poetic terrorism. Fantastic phrase. Um, he writes, art sabotage strives to be perfectly exemplary, but at the same time to retain an element of opacity, not propaganda, but aesthetic shock, appallingly direct, yet also subtly angled, action as metaphor. And I find this to be so interesting in many ways. He calls this the dark side of poetic terrorism, creation through destruction. They cannot serve any party, nor any nihilism, nor even art itself. I mean, I could just read this whole book and it would be better than my presentation. But the point is, <laughs> um, the point is that, you know, it's the ambiguity of this kind of work that I think is really interesting. And rather than it being a kind of, you know, weak co-option of radical protest by art, I see it as this really interesting um, and poignant hybrid. One more work, sorry, it's a bit blurry. Uh, this image, it's a press image. I'm so obsessed with this. Um, and it's written about really convincingly in the book Strike Art by Yates McKee, amazing book about the creative uh, activism that comes out of Occupy. The connection of the SI here to me has to do with language and double meanings. Um, Debor writes, the need for a secret language for passwords is inseparable from a tendency towards play. Um, that's in the user's guide to Detourment. So there's this pairing of freedom of pl and play, um, but also this undercurrent of violence. Okay, so what is this work? Basically, this is during a rally for Michael Ferguson in New York City um, a few days after uh, the grand jury had refused to indict the white officer who slaughtered him. And this is police commissioner Bill Bratton um, at the center of it all. And so basically there were these peaceful um, sort of solidarity, uh, people are just you know standing around, there were speeches, these kinds of things in Times Square, really critical, this is Times Square, um, you know, mega complex of capital. Um, and basically Bratton decides to show up, right? It's a show of force, literally, decides to show up, all the NYPD, for no reason. Like, and it's really like violence coming down on this protest, right? Because this is not symbolically, but like also actually the people who enacted this violence. And so it gets really tense. Um, this was a really bad move and people aren't sure why he did it. I mean, besides really just to, um, to show that violence of the state. And so what happens is there's a protester with a paint bomb who launches it at him. And this is the moment right after the paint bomb is thrown. So it hits him kind of here. He gets it on his face. I love this security guard cracks me up in the front because he's so serious. Also has the paint on him, but people aren't sure what happened, right? They just see red and it's the color of blood. What I love about this image is it seems like a detourment that just happened, like in the site itself. You see above Bratton's head, the double um, arrow of um, just happens to be part of the signage from um, American Eagle behind. You see this uh, poster that says winging it is not an emergency. I forget if I have a picture of it. No, it's too bad. Uh, it's, it's basically post 9-11, like propaganda that comes out about having an emergency plan when emergencies happen. There's something about this that just couldn't even be, I mean, it's like this freeze frame, which is just from a bad news site, which is why it is blown up and looks blurry. This freeze frame to me is just so, you couldn't like make it this perfect, right? But this is what the terrain is. I mean, this is. 
Is it possible to call this an anti-spectacle? There is clearly a way in which the, the notion of it possibly being a spectacle is completely undercut and very subversively becomes yeah. something else. And I was looking at the two arrows, I don't know if the ones you meant, the two arrows yeah. pointed down in the center of the shot, yeah. but just in case you didn't know where to look, it's here. Yeah. Uh, but to me, and the previous images too, the, the, the cobblestone, there's a sense of being an anti-spectacle because yeah. rather than uh, focusing on broken windows and crowds running through the streets and all the rest of it, there's this weird thing that, yeah. what, like you say, what do you do with it? So it is both a spectacle and it undercuts itself at the same time. And then, as you also point out, what do you do next, right? Do you, do you shoot the thing? Do you, you know, deflate it or whatever? Yeah. And it, it is that, that weird pivoting back and forth between uh, being something that catches your eye and yet it doesn't yield up its, 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 uh, its meaning very easily, right? It has all sorts of other things going on. And the color, especially the color looks very much like blood. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I love that anti-spectacle. I definitely wrote that down. Um, yeah, and it, you're right, it doesn't yield its meaning immediately, which is why it's hard for me to put into words everything that's happening here. I mean, it's, it's very moving and very violent and uh, also kind of goofy, but the goofiness is like so macabre. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so Yates McKee writes, he calls this action painting, which is fair enough, um, says this, uh, like, I mean, a la, you know, uh, what's his name? We know action painting, right? Giant uh, painting. Jackson wow. Pollock. Thank you, oh my God. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so he calls this an action painting with a surreal dual logic. He says, on the one hand, it was a kind of disarming, even laughable piece of performance art. And yet the image of the paint bombed Bratton was met with a sense of collective joy. It was as if the red liquid were spl uh, spurting from a repressed wellspring of antagonism pulsing beneath the surface of the city, the blood of New Yorkers killed by the NYPD splattering back up the chain of command to the ultimate arbiter of deadly force. Um, part of the reason I wanted to put this kind of near the end of this discussion is that, you know, direct action does involve, I, in, in these radical forums, it involves a lot of risk. Um, the Diego Velasquez, the activist who threw this paint bomb was really violently arrested. Like he threw paint, you know what I'm saying? But it, it, was, it was really yeah. brutal. He was in jail for quite a while. I don't know, maybe 12 months or about a year, something like that. Wow. Um, and so, uh, you know, the seriousness of this kind of symbolic sort of disarmament, but um, also disarray, this reorganizing of the symbolic landscape where you might even think you've been shot. Like if you imagine this happening, right? Have I been shot? Do I have paint on me? I mean, I, what I see in this kind of art is the way, I mean, if he had just shot him, it would be different, right? How does the fear function? That's really interesting to me. Like how does the violence, function and how does this function as a tactic? Um, those are open questions um, that I'm going to leave to you. I just love this image of the security guard also standing under the arrows after it's happened, like guarding the paint. <laughs> Why, we will never know, but uh, it's just funny. And then this couple behind who's like just gazing up at the signs and everything. It's again, it's that kind of macabre ridiculousness that um, really stands out to me here. Just the final work I'll show as an example. This is also a work that I feel very strongly about. This is from Standing Rock, um, which you know you all know about, and it was near the end of the protest. It's by an artist, Knupsha Hanska Luger, who took the form of the riot shield, right, the uh, the size of it, the scale of it, and put mirrors on it. And you know, Standing Rock saw a lot of violent action towards the water protectors. Um, especially violent was the use of water cannons, which again is one of these symbolic reversals that it's just like so painful to think about. You know, you can tell it's winter, right? This is North Dakota. It's like where I'm from, Manitoba, you know, it's a two hour drive away. Um, you know, it's cold. And the thing about water cannons when you use them in the cold is it's like bullets, like it's very painful. It makes people very sick. And so, you know, you can almost see the residue of the ice. I don't know if that's from the cannons or not, but this is what these people have been facing, right? People who are just trying to protect their, um, their land um, because of the pipeline being built. And so they held these riot shields that they attached mirrors to. And they said something like, this is the image that your grandchildren will see of you. This is the image your children will see of you as the riot cops are advancing on them. And pushing them out of the camp, this is an image from one of the final days. And I mean, Again, I don't think this kind of practice needs to be called direct action or small a anarchist to have any kind of meaning. It's theory that draws meaning from this kind of work. But um, what I do see here and what I see as a positive extension of the SI is we're still talking very seriously about terrain and violence and the state, but um, 
there's an interesting relationship to time. You know, when I think about direct action, where is it, what, in what way is it direct? It is direct insofar as political tactics go, but it's also direct in space and direct in time, right? You're not waiting around for someone else to do anything. You're, it's not happening elsewhere. It's happening where you are. Um, and this is something that I feel very strongly about, about the in space and in time. Maybe I'm kind of a localist at heart, um, but you know, this is the direct in space and direct in time. However, tooled in a way that is very ambiguous. You're talking about the image your children and grandchildren will see. You are talking generally, generationally. You know, you are talking at a scale that is total. Um, and so we'll just finish by looking at Debord's both critique and support of anarchism because he talks about this totality um, in quite an interesting way. So in Society of the Spectacle, he has um, quite a long section where he talks about anarchists. Um, and yeah, there's both critique and support. So I'll just read here, this is 52 on the annotated version. Um, I don't know if the page numbers are the same, but he says, the fact that anarchists have seen the goal of proletarian revolution as immediately present, direct in space and time, represents both the strength and the weaknesses of collectivist anarchist struggles. The only forms of anarchism that can be taken seriously the pretensions of the individualist forms of anarchism have always been ludicrous. So here he's talking about this immediate presentism, the direct in space and time as both the strength and the weakness. And I find that I can't help myself agreeing with that. Um, but he also says just a page down, anarchism rejects the existing conditions in the name of the whole of life. And he's counterposing this to Marxism. He's saying Marxism is still partial because it's not bringing the critique to the level of the state in the way that it needs to be. And so this he describes as rejecting the existing conditions in the name of the whole of life. I think that he had a personal sort of burden to, I don't know, bear uh, with the anarchists because in the press, the SI and in sort of theoretical writing were being called anarchists all the time and DeBoer did not want this label. And so it's a bit of an ambiguous relationship. Um, I'll just read one more quote from this section. I mean, if you read through all of Society of the Spectacle, what I found so interesting when I finally did that was when I got to this chapter on time. It's near the end, I think it's chapter two, um, Spectacular Time, and then chapter five is about uh, territory. And so here again, we have the direct in space and time, but I wanted to focus on the time aspect because um, it's pertinent to my research now. So in Spectacular Time, he writes, as Hegel showed, time is the necessary alienation, the terrain where the subject realizes himself by losing himself, becomes other in order to become truly himself. In total contrast, the current form of alienation is imposed on the producers of an estranged present. In the spatial alienation, the society that radically separates the subject from the activity it steals from him is in reality separating him from his own time. This potentially surmountable social alienation is what has presented and paralyzed the possibilities and risks of a living alienation within time. So while this is quite a mouthful, what I find to be interesting is the way that DeBoer traces a change in the way we are alienated from time. He's looking at Hegel and saying, you know, we were alienated across the span of our personal and collective histories, right? So there's an alienation of myself today from myself a year ago because of the way, you know, my history and narrative is wrapped up in that that is shared. And also saying that there's a collective alienation in the sharing of stories of time and its passing, you know, we become alienated from something personal. So the dual pull between the personal historical and the collective historical has a kind of, again, necessary alienation as he describes it. But he says what happens in the present with um, the spectacle is that we have a very direct alienation. We have a direct, we have, a, we have an alienation in our own space and in our own time. A very immediate, a very immediate, 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 a very immediate alienation, mm -hmm. <laughs> a very present alienation. Let's go with that word, stick with the temporal language. Um, and I find that to be really interesting because I've been thinking about this in the context of pandemic time. What will collective action look like after pandemic time? And if there's one thing I could say about pandemic time, it's that our alienation or our sense of time is very immediate. It's me, my time, my timeline, my day. I mean, I live alone. So maybe if you live with a partner, it's you and your partner's time, but you're like a unit, right? So what I'm wondering is what will it look like to have a collective timeline again? Or will there be collective timelines? Will they be harder to fuse together? Um, or what will it look like to share time is basically the kind of question that I'm asking. So just to finish, I mean, this small a anarchist 
and also the without origin. Um, go back to the question of, you know, what it means to think about the symbolic in our present time. Um, as we think about direct action, you know, in a contemporary context, something that has never, you know, that has always been symbolic, I guess the question is, what does it mean to think about the symbolic as direct? And what are the implications of this in the context of, you know, direct space and direct time? Um, I don't really have a more eloquent way to end than that. This is sort of where my, my uh, mind, um, is trailing off, but um, I know I've raised more questions than answers, but I do appreciate everyone listening and um, really any feedback is useful to me at this point. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks. Okay, well, th thank you very much, uh, Emily. Uh, just I'll just say a couple of very brief things. Uh, one of the uh, really important ideas that you present is this, this notion of time uh, that of course, one of the main uh, issues that Breton and the rest of these sort of um, Hegelians, we'll call them that, studied under Kojev, uh, they all kind of agreed collectively that Hegel's idea of historical development is fine, uh, alienation is fine, but that final overcoming is what they rejected. Mm -hmm. And so for, uh, for De Boer to bring that back into the mix and say, well, look, you know, it is an alienation in the present. It is uh, both in terms of our temporal and spatial existence, but we will never have that final overcoming. What do we do with acknowledging the development of history, the movement of time, uh, collectively, individually, but knowing full well that at the end of the road, there is, not, there is no final overcoming, right? There is no reconciliation and we're not going to be at home in the world, which is what Hegel always wanted us to be. Uh, we need to, to reconcile ourselves to, to that. So that was the, the first idea. Uh, the second is um, the, the very clearly stated idea of cyclical versus linear time or the three dimensionality of time. Uh, cyclical time is, is typically the capitalist time as he calls it in, in uh, uh, Society of the Spectacle. This idea that seasons, right? That it's almost like a natural movement. Uh, every Christmas we have a sale, every you know, Easter we have a sale. They look at it as seasons and or you know, quarterlies as opposed to linear time, which is what we exist in or uh, what uh, others uh, such as uh, Carl Kosick, uh, the Czech philosopher talked about the three dimensionality of time our awareness of the past, our position in the present, and our movement towards that future. And we're constantly doing this. I, I argue in, in my project that Kosek's uh, uh, idea of time is closer to the one the SI don't articulate clearly, but I think are on, on the way to doing this. And of course, Kosek's book came out in 1963, uh, but it hadn't been translated into French. Uh, it wasn't even translated to English till, till the early 70s. So we can understand why the two didn't know of each other. But this notion of time really being configured differently for De Beau as opposed to the typical capitalist uh, view is, is an important one. Uh, so I, that's all I'd like to say. If anybody would like to, uh, to pipe in with some comments, we can perhaps segue into sort of a, an overview of the SI. Uh, did anyone have anything that they wanted to, um, to ask uh, Emily or to add? Uh, start with Maxwell and then uh, Pajashini. Uh, thank you, Emily, for your presentation. Uh, I have a million questions, but I'll start with a basic one. Um, when you say symbolic direct action, my mind immediately drifts to post-structuralism. Mm -hmm. This isn't a basic question. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trapping you. Uh, is there a relationship there? Like the SI and post-structuralism are so temporally intimate. So I'm wondering if anarchism more broadly and this idea of symbolic direct action has to do with the kind of decentering that goes on with the post-structuralism and that reality in a, in a way kind of gets grounded in language and also divorced from language at the same time. It does a weird sort of like it's directly and symbolically related. So do you have words or thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think what I find really like compelling about this kind of activism as I see it happening and also with the theory that plods along with it is um, 
I think it really needed that moment of the complete decentering of both identity, and I think especially identity in the post-structuralist vein is important here, maybe more so than language to this kind of activism. You have a lot of people who come from like political theory and sociology backgrounds doing this kind of work. It just kind of happens that way, um, as well as, of course, artists. Um, I mean, part of the reason why I don't like Saul Newman's post-anarchism is I think that what I see today is a lot of um, grounding in choice. There's, a, how do I, I back up? Post-structuralism to me has always seemed deeply anti-political and I take this in the realm of art history, not anti, but like apolitical. I take this from art history um, in of course the writing of uh, October Magazine which is, you know, the site of Marxist post-structuralist um, art critical writing um, and kind of like a Bible for, you know, art criticism of that time period. But what I see is um, not enough emphasis on out of the fray, out of the diffusion of meaning through language, um, the decentering of identity. I don't see enough uh, choice at the end of that. I know this is kind of a weird thing to say, but this kind of work has to do a lot with um, tactics. And so as regards tactics and practice and making, um, I think what you see after 2000 is an agglomeration of people who feel all kinds of different ways. You do have a lot of people who come from a kind of Deleuzian uh, vein, but anarchism is very today affinity and issue based. So, you know, here's a protest that has to do with race. How are we going to get together and do something to do about it? There doesn't, what I'm saying is people don't feel the need to agree necessarily theoretically to do things together practically. And I find that to be like deeply inspiring and interesting. So I think that there needed to be this kind of post-structuralist moment for anarchism to be able to have that kind of mutual aid um, quality that it has today. Of course, mutual aid is an old term, but the way it works today on the basis of issues and not necessarily ideas um, I find very compelling, but I would not say that it is, you know, post-structuralist today or something like that. Um, and actually, Debord has this critique of anarchism. He says that they're too worried about consensus. Like, they always have to agree. Like, you go to a meeting and, like, everyone doesn't agree. You don't do thing X. And I can actually say from experience that is true. <laughs> it can be like, okay, so what do people think? And then, you know, if we're not all on the same page, it's like, all right, well, we're either going to talk about this for six hours until we reach consensus or we're just going to move on with our lives. So, yeah, in terms of political organizing, um, I would say choice is very important, and I don't necessarily see a strong role of choice in a lot of post-structuralist uh, thought. That works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paishini, would you like to uh, add to the conversation or move it into a different direction? Uh, yeah, so that's a great presentation. Uh, I don't really have a question for you. But I really liked how you uh, read into that particular section on uh, temporality and Hegel. And I just wanted to add to that because my paper is also related to the Bowen Hegel, uh, unfortunately. And uh, it's, it's not really about temporality, but the question of temporality comes up, I mean, time and again, when you're reading into the Hegelian side of the Bowen's text. Um, and so, I mean, the interpretation that I uh, came across that I found very interesting for that sort of uh, I thought that sort of an idea was is that uh, everything and these are Tom Bunyan's words everything that was previously uh, absolute no everything that was previously ideal becomes historical so I mean uh, I guess uh, and I guess Bunyan is also um, reading the text against uh, texts like science of logic and phenomenology of spirit. So uh, the, the progression of natural consciousness and into a self-alienated spirit, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, he believes that the Bo's project is to sort of realize that on a historical level. So which is why, I mean, your, your interpretation was a lot more rich, rich but uh, yeah, I mean, this is the interpretation that I came along with. This is also interesting. That's, that's all I wanted to say. But great yeah. presentation. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting how seriously, I mean, as soon as you read any philosophy that deals in politics, it's so much about time. And it, when I realized this, it kind of blew my mind. Like all political thinking is doing is talking about how to manage time in a way. And I find this to be really, really weird, especially I'm thinking about leftism and thinking through anarchist critiques of Marxism, they all have to do with time, revolutionary time, time waiting, to, you know, as well as, you know, st the state and all that. But um, the role of time is something I'm super fascinated with in this kind of political thought, because it's, it's so huge, right? Even in the day to day, how we talk about political action, it's all about time. Oh, I hope this will happen. Oh, we'll wait and see. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, again, you're in your own, t you're, you know, it's such a, well, again, I'm being recorded. It's a, it's a, it's a cop out, right? To only ever talk about the future, in my opinion. Um, right, yeah. and I, I just wanted to add to that since a couple of people did not attend my presentation was that, um, and I have nothing against you for that. It's totally fine <laughs> uh, because I mean I was confused until then. But um, one of the arguments that I am trying to make, although it's not completely original, is that. Uh, they both whole project sort of revolves around the Hegelian absolute, but bringing mm -hmm. the absolute to a historical level. So, um, I mean, this whole project of um, whatever kind of revolution and whatever future uh, one realizes on the basis of this is sort of the progression of uh, the spirit. Um, so yeah, that's all. That's mm -hmm. all. I was just going to add, uh, in terms of the preoccupation with time in political philosophy, if you think about some of the earliest stuff, even Hobbes's The Leviathan uh, or John Locke's, uh, you know, his two treatises on government, it starts with a fiction, right? It starts with the fiction of the state of nature. And so you have this hypothetical past that becomes the foundation for political philosophy. So talk about a kind of slippage where if you were, I mean, students will ask, well, sir, was there a time like this? No, it's it's a fiction. In fact, you could go back, you know, 50,000 years and the kinds of worlds that Locke and Hobbes are describing really kind of didn't exist because you would, would have family structures where you have, you know, a father's a figurehead, you would have tribes, you would have small communities. Uh, I, I said, I don't have an example. I'm not an anthropologist, but I don't have an example. What I want you to remember, though, is this, the foundation of political philosophy is built on a hypothesis of something that may have happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So the notion of time is already problematic from the get-go, right? Some of the earliest, uh, you know, manifestos that are political in this case, uh, have this really interesting foundation of, of a fictitious past, which mm -hmm. somehow becomes the precedent for things to change now and for the future. So as, as you were mentioning that and, and you and Prashini were having an exchange, it just sort of popped into my mind. I've had this conversation before, I, I've, I've mentioned this, but yeah, when they kind of look at me, said, yeah, there's two ways you can do theory. You can build sort of a structure around it. And again, as artists, you'll appreciate this. Imagine building a scaffold around a large chunk of granite that's eight feet tall. And you use that scaffold to create that piece of art. And when it's done, you take away the scaffold and there's a the finished product. So your scaffold is a kind, of, a kind of hypothesis or a fiction that is built around it. But once the, the project is done, they're done away with. The problem is in political philosophy, the scaffolding, i.e. the state of nature, continues to be embedded into, into the theory. So these kinds of issues, I mean, you could, you could unpack them and say, yeah, political, political theory is very temporal, concerned with time. Uh, but when you look back to where it begins, it's rather problematic to say the least. Uh, Maxwell, I think you wanted to add something as well. Your, your hand was up. Uh, I do, but Peter and Judith both came oh. before me. Okay, who would like to go first, uh, Judith? Okay. Oh, Peter. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, so thank you. Um, hopefully this will, I can uh, coherently express um, this. Uh, okay, two things. Um, one on, on on the issue of uh, time and politics, uh, Emily, you might find the work of um, uh, weird theory uh, colleague of mine, Ed Berger, interesting. I posted his Twitter in the chat. Thanks. Um, um, and uh, but but then I guess so. So 
now, now there's a chance I'll straw person your argument, um, which I'm okay with in this uh, <laughs> sense. Um, but uh, but 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 I'm, th I'm I'm thinking of like what you were talking about about like um, the uh, RK or the like the lack of origin, um, and I guess I'm wondering like like whether that's um, not not necessarily reactionary, but whether it's um, able to be co-opted. And I'm thinking and 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 and, and, and I'm thinking specifically of like so. Um, th th this will this will hopefully tie together. In in Italy, there is a um, quasi anarchic uh, fascist group called Casa Pound, um, who uh, appropriate anarchist symbols like ACAP. They're very anti police. They're direct action. Uh, they work with the community. They like feed um, the 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 Italians who have been fucked over by. Uh, by, 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 by the EU, but they also don't like immigrants. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, the immigrants, by the way, are the ones that are also fucking over the Italians. Um, and so, and, 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 and so it's like, they share, they share a lot of similarities with like, um, like anarchist groups and say like Pittsburgh where I am, um, but except for like the anti-immigrant rhetoric. And so I guess I'm wondering like, um, when, 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 when we get to the level of like, well, we can all kind of have like different opinions, but like, as long as we're still working together and doing things together, it's all like Gucci. Um, I'm not really sure. Like, I I I I I I buy that. Like 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 it seems like I'm 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 a little bit worried that like under your interpretation, it's like yeah, we should like be cool with fascists who are like clothing the needy and feeding the hungry, um, and just overlook some of their like origins, right? Like, like, why not? Like, why not have a core set of beliefs or an originary fiction of anarchism? Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, actually, if you could send me the name of that Italian group, I'd appreciate that. The Nationalist Anarchists, which started in the UK, they started in the UK, and they're also um, yeah. primarily American now, or a similar example. We talked about this in the climate change class, and they literally do all the same thing. They they do the Black Bloc. You know, they have all the rhetoric, but they are also white supremacists. So, you know, just a little twist at the end there for you. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, this is why I brought up the Hito Sterl said the same thing. And actually Arna de Bovar, who did his, uh, who did a theory center talk uh, a few months ago, actually said something similar too, um, about the far left and far right increasingly looking identical. I guess with the, uh, sort of theoretical questioning I have around what it means to make a claim that is without an, uh, an origin or first principle or etc. Um, is not to like as a historian not look into origins but like to ask what it means to have a political philosophy founded on the idea that they are not based in origins. And I should say this really because it comes from because it gets its political group nomenclature through the French, this has to do with the king. So the king is the Arca insofar as he is like God's representative on earth, the first whatever of the state, all these things. So that would be the very like direct modern sort of political connotation of the Arca. Um, but I brought up the sort of earlier uh, versions, not just because they tie to the etymology, but I think really to the ideas. Um, so I definitely think like as a historian, we need to look at origins, but then as a theorist to ask what it means to state that one does not have origins. So not entirely a question, but um, the reason the Agamemnon is so interesting and troubling to me where he says capitalism is also anarchic is because I just like totally agree. I completely agree that capitalism claims it is without origins. But again, this doesn't mean it doesn't have an origin, but it's more like how does this function sort of ideologically within society, um, this feeling that it is eternal out the back end, if you will, uh, into the past, as Ed points out, but also into the future. We will never not have capitalism. We will never, we never did not have something that looked like this kind of exchange is a very, uh, it's, a, it's like a religious claim. Um, he's also tying it to Christianity. He's saying this is secularized Christianity is capitalism without origins. God was always there. Capital was always there, you know. 
So on the one hand, I see like a selective sort of detorma or retooling of the without origins in the anarchist. But at the same time, it does very quickly sort of devolve into dangerous territory, as you point out. Um, yeah, it's, a very, it's very slippery. I don't really know what to say about it, but it is something I'm thinking about. Uh, Judith. Yeah, I had a separate comment, but now I want to weigh in on that. Um, I don't know how to you can unraise. Do both. <laughs> how do I unraise my hand? Oh, there we are. Oh. Um, yeah, I think that um, Peter's question does get to um, some of the um, the difficulty and challenge at the center of anarchist politics. And as someone who identifies as an anarchist, if I have to identify as anything, um, that's definitely a challenge worth taking up. So yeah, first of all, I think there's a question of not confusing the aesthetics of a politics for the politics itself. So yeah. we are in a time when a lot of right-wing and left-wing politics have begun to look the same and it's extremely confusing. And it just looks like a lot of like violent factions dressing in certain clothing and wanting to like riot or whatever it is or be unlawful to express something or carry signs in a protest. Um, and yeah, I think it's just really important to continue to do the work of critically looking beyond an yeah. aesthetics of a politics in order to distinguish a politics. Yeah. But what's more key in Peter's question um, that he sort of framed as a question about origins, but I think it's a larger question, is what to do with a politics of multiplicity. So anarchism is a politics of multiplicity and a politics of process. It refuses origin and it refuses singularity of purpose or singularity of mission in favor of saying um, it can contain multiple aims, it can contain multiple projects, and it can constantly be in motion and constantly be adapting and shifting to suit the time. So then what do you do with ethics? How can that politics of multiplicity be ethical. And that's sort of how I understand what Peter's question was. Does it not, like if it doesn't have a project, if it doesn't have an aim, how does it not just slide into fascism? And the answer is that it tries to be a politics that's constantly at work on itself. Yeah. People are always in discussion, <laughs> trying, to, trying to attempt to um, impact the world in some way, question their own political aims, question the values that their politics are actually implementing. So if someone walks into a, a, an anarchist meeting and says, this is great, I'm an anarchist, I hate immigrants, let's close the borders, that in terms of like proper anarchist um, philosophy and practice, that would immediately be, be cause for a discussion, for a collective reworking and rethinking and retooling. Mm -hmm. Does that action and does that of ethics and does that approach and does an anti-immigrant sentiment fit with the world we wanna see? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a politics of process, it's a politics of multiplicity, it's a politics that's uncomfortable because it always tries to sit with multiplicity, mm -hmm. but that also refuses, uh, ideally refuses fascism, refuses hatred because people are coming together to try and continuously question um, what's at work in their political stance and what yeah. would benefit them and what would benefit society. Yeah, so honestly, so perfect, everything you just said. This is the question when people are like, oh, well, isn't it just not left or not right? Isn't anarchism just, I don't know, ambiguous or something? And the answer is no, because it's fundamentally based on the nurturing of a collective. When you have a anti-status politics that's fundamentally based on the nurturing of the individual for the individual's sake, then you have that far right libertarianism. You know, they do they slide into each other? People always say that shit. Like, actually, no, because, you know, go to a libertarian group, you know, or go to a anarchist group, live with them and tell me, like, I don't know, I don't want to be trite, but like, are they more likely to, like, are they throwing garbage all over the ground? Do they hate immigrants? Do they beat their wives? Like, I'm telling you, the collectivist side is going to be, we're talking about like day to day ethics, you know what I'm saying? Um, maybe that's going too far, but it's not the same. The affect is not the same. It may look the same on the outside, but you know, it's a very different, um, it's a whole different way of approaching it. Again, fundamentally collective. Um, At the same time, uh, if you're moving too far to the right, what happens to that fundamental, that, uh, that foundation of freedom? 
I mean, the freedom of the immigrants, what happens to, to theirs? Is that still important? Or is that just sort of of the moment, which again, it, it has no origins, but I guess a relationship that each has to their own idea of freedom is gonna dictate with their, their behavior. Uh, Chris and Maxwell, you both had questions. Chris, would you like to go next? I, I think Maxwell had his hand up before oh. I did. So if you'd like to go, then I will concede. <laughs> Oh, I think he's waved you on. <laughs> okay. Um, well, if that's the case, um, thank you. And thank you as well, Emily. It was a really great presentation, really interesting and thought provoking and rich. Um, my comments were kind of in relation to some of the points Judas was made in response to Peter. Um, so I'm just going to lower the hand. My, uh, there we go. Um, in any case, though, I, I was wondering if it would be helpful um, or um, useful to your thinking on anarchism, it may be more in the lower A sense than the capital A sense um, that you outlined in your presentation. I'm thinking about kind of, it is a sort of like in terms of direct action as sort of pragmatic or um, in terms of it being like ever changing or this desire to like be malleable and um, not have kind of fixed concluding point that it's like teleologically driven towards or something. Um, I was thinking about William James's essay, like what pragmatism means or what, what is pragmatism? Um, and he describes it as like a methodology more than an ideology. So not a solution to a problem, but like a program for more work. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this focus on tracing in terms of direct action, the, the, the relationship relationship you've outlined between theory and practice and I believe your quote um, excuse my paraphrasing if it's not uh, the right words but um, practice theory needs practice more than practice needs theory um, that that I thought was like a really nice succinct sort of point to make um, and that focus on like kind of practicality and the the actual um, consequent like the the consequences in both your daily life um, but also um, the, the focus on sort of uh, how these, um, how your direct action actually impacts um, like your lived experience in a way. Um, I don't know if I'm trying to maybe just read pragmatism into um, the sort of lowercase direct action anarchy points that you've made, but especially Judith, when you were speaking about um, okay, well, where, how, how does, how does ethics come into play here? Well, um, the fact that it is ever changing and um, self evaluating constantly is where ethics comes in and how it doesn't slip into something like a fixed concluding point of like a fascist um, totalitarian kind of um, logical conclusion to something because it doesn't have a telos right it's that's kind of the point um, and that's why it is empowering in a way yeah so I was at least um, things that I was thinking over here in my um, <laughs> pragmatic paradigm based on the writing I'm doing right now too. But yeah. I, I actually don't understand pragmatism at all. I just infer what it means based on the name. I need to get into it because there are a lot of anarchist pragmati pragmatists. Pragmatists? There's lots of them, especially American, like uh, Richard Wardy. Isn't that his name? He's uh, isn't he a pragmatist and an anarchist. Um, there's yeah. Lots of because they do have a natural affinity so that's definitely a place that I need to uh, go so thanks for the the James I'll look into that for sure I was just going to add uh, before uh, we move to Maxwell's question uh, the slide that you showed of the act up group in the year uh, well this would be probably by about the mid 80s uh, that to me is an excellent example of someone that took a pragmatic approach mm -hmm. to a problem that uh, was first addressed through what we'll call the typical channels, uh, you know, asking the government to, to put uh, fund, you know, more research into possible uh, mm -hmm. cures or at least medication for AIDS and so on. And they were, it just fell in deaf ears. It literally fell in deaf ears. Uh, this is, of course, at a time when uh, globally everyone shifted to the right, kind of where we're at right now, uh, both in the UK, in Canada, in the US. And basically, it was convenient for them to ignore this issue because it would seem to be of one specific pocket of the population. But by the mid '80s, would act up. I mean, the, these all of these in, these individuals were fearless. I mean, they literally walked into traffic and laid down. They stormed cathedrals. I mean, these 
they were very selective uh, and, and highly targeted, but man, did they get noticed right, up, uh, right away. All of a sudden, all of a sudden people start thinking, well, you know, really we should. And of course, right about the same time, the, the, the disease moves sort of, we'll call it into the mainstream where, you know, people that would not have been associated with uh, either drug users or the homosexual community and so on, now start getting sick suddenly everything changes. But the ACT UP people were literally taking their lives into their, into their own hands because many of them were sick, right? There was nothing to lose. So their degree of pragmat pragmatism uh, was highly motivating. And they were able to motivate very quickly, especially in New York, uh, other uh, cities around uh, the US, but primarily New York, um, and it was highly effective because it came at just the right time when people were just, you know, ready to ignore it. Uh, and really for, I think the first time I heard about it was in a French magazine, it would have been late, late 1982, maybe 83, but it wasn't until about late 84, 85 that the, we'll say the general population heard about it. But it was in that, that in between time that ACT UP really sort of mobilized and uh, became as pragmatic as you could be, but yeah. very selective targets. And the end result was, uh, you know, was that people woke up and realized what was going on. And uh, I, I have friends, uh, two friends that are, you know, were uh, diagnosed in the early 90s and are still alive because of that work. Uh, so it was, you know, it was absolutely life and death for them to do this. But it was, it was remarkable to see how quickly this thing, you know, was mobilized and, and made, it made its impact. Um, so enough of that. Uh, Maxwell, I wanted you to, to uh, continue. Thank you. Um, question was uh, quite kind of selfish. It's based on this book, um, yeah. which Emily is familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in Psychopolitics, Hans starts the book by saying that freedom will, actually, I'll just read it. It's easier. Freedom will prove to be merely an interlude. And at the beginning of your presentation, when you were talking about freedom, it made me think of that uh, because Han wants to kind of strike this difference between uh, etymological history or root of freedom as related to friendship and community and freedom as a modernist conception that's related to change. Mm. And the question that I have kind of succinctly is what is the relationship between anarchism and freedom in that like kind of dichotomy or it does it fit maybe in some other category because anarchism especially in relation to the SI and modernism feels very uh, popularly believed to lean towards change and like you know that avant-garde invention uh, brand new origins and we're starting all over again but I know the way, uh, actually, sorry, I'm answering my own question, so I'll stop. <laughs> uh, anarchism and change or anarchism and friendship. Thoughts? <laughs> um, freedom is one of those things that personally I probably don't believe in. I don't know if that's a weird thing to say, but insofar as it's a word that implies something total, I don't think I believe in total freedom. Um, that's maybe the sociologist in me, uh, the board de, um, I think everything is very partial and so I don't find it to be a super useful word besides as an ideal. Um, so maybe I can just rephrase my question to something a little more useful. Um, is freedom for you in relation to anarchism an outdated concept like Han wants to yes. claim? Yeah, I think so. I definitely think so. And that's part of the reason I started with that critique. I mean, what you see in this early, uh, like end of the 19th, 20th century thought is everybody wants to talk about Marxist, anarchists, uh, liberal, democratic thinkers. Everybody wants to talk about what's natural to humans. What is, what is human nature? And then let's build a politics on it. So is like consensus natural, a la democracy? Okay, then let's, you know, have this politics over here is, uh, you know, material, <laughs> material, uh, material gain, I guess, <laughs> is, is, is it all about the material disalienation? I, that's the only word I can honestly think of is, is that what's the most important, you know, be, being connected to our work and our means, you know, then you're more likely to be a Marxist. Anarchists feel that they're the ones who have the capital on freedom because, 
for them, freedom is being outside of the state. No state, freedom. For me, that's just like ridiculous. I mean, what a lot of you, what you see in a lot of the sort of post-anarchist writing or the kind of 80s, 90s writing is um, a thinking through like what really hierarchy means at a very micro level. So like more charisma, I have a lot of charisma. I'm just gonna say that's a, hi that's a hierarchy that creates hierarchy. Um, having more free time creates hierarchy. Having, uh, you know, being good at putting words together has hierarchy. Um, happening to have access to, I don't know, artistic skills that other people in your, don't, in your group don't have is a hierarchy. So part of what Ju uh, Judith put so beautifully, the kind of constant negotiation of multiplicity is this realization there's no, this neutral ground is such a fantasy. And to me, whoa, to me, that's what anarchist freedom was trying to talk about in that sort of early moment. It's this kind of purity. And I don't know, I mean, I don't, none of us believe in purity, right? I mean, maybe some of us do. Um, my friend who's taking philosophy certainly does. So maybe it's, you know, some people do and some people don't. But um, I just think that freedom is this word that tries to claim this very neutral, this very level ground. Freedom is this very level concept. And I think that's just like really ridiculous to talk about in our moment or any moment, but, you know, increasingly, you know? So I think this sort of, working through mutual aid on the basis of issues in a shifting and ongoing way is really, um, doesn't worry about freedom. And I feel like a lot of the work that theory does is kind of on these grounds too. It kind of wants to seek this neutral ground, this level ground. How do we get to this shared ground, this like, this, you know, equal, this, you know, even without calling it freedom. And um, I think that's a huge problem with writing in general and with theory in general. Um, I can summarize what I'm hearing. Uh, what I'm getting is that you're saying anarchism is more of like a Bakhtinian dialogic negotiation instead of a like Hegelian Marxist dialectic. Sure. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis relation. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Judith and then Chris. Yeah, um, this is an entirely different subject and now I can't remember like really the thoughts I had, but I'll just raise the topic. Um, there was something in Emily's presentation that really intrigued me regarding seriousness and play. And in the analysis of direct action, both in the contemporary sense and in terms of the SI, um, this question was raised about um, the role of play um, and how, how serious a politics has to be or how serious um, political interventions have to be. Because the SI, um, that was one of the groups that inaugurated the idea of play into political action. But I find it very paradoxical because even just in the quotes that you read and in stuff we've read by Debord, the way play is discussed is very serious and play is taken seriously. Um, and in that intervention that you showed of the, um, the Spanish concrete block, um, I felt like that was another really great visual metaphor for um, the seriousness of play. So I, I just think that I had a lot of thoughts when you were talking about that paradox and the, the, the opportunity to be playful in politics, but at the same time, um, the way that playful protest remains serious and like how to tread that line um, and how valuable play is and like what kind of experiments that creates or openings like possible openings for political intervention play creates but it's still serious yeah totally I mean the kind of art this kind of protest art socially engaged community engaged art whatever this whole it's an alternative stream it has an alternative canon and it has a different history and the SI is so fundamental in the origin story of this kind of artwork and you find it in this writing um, which is especially exploding in the last couple of years um, another great example is the there's so many groups like this but um, one of my favorites is the revolutionary anarchist clown block and they dress like clowns and go to really oh, okay. serious confrontations with police here. because honestly a pol police officer is less likely to beat the shit out of you if you're dressed like a clown it tactically is true it's a it's and so these guys are genius i met one of them 
And he was just like, yeah, like, you know, I would go in the black block and we would all get the shit beaten out of us, you know, with clubs and everything. Cause who cares about a bunch of anarchists, but you dress up like a clown and everybody's like, oh, I don't know. Like, I can't, you know, and it'll be in the media. There's also, there's a group called the pink block who did this in Czechoslovakia. They, it was very campy. They all dressed in tutus and pink and um, you know, those little batons kids have with the stars at the end. I had one of those. So great. Um, and they all were dressed up like this. And like, you know, they didn't get beat up, even though this was a very serious protest. And like, it's so funny, great photo ops, but also, you know, practically very useful. And so, yeah, there's the tactical angle, but there's also like a human spirit angle. You know what I'm saying? Like that kind of work is very engaging for people who do that kind of activism. Um, if you take yourself too seriously all of the time, it's not just draining, sad, you know, activist burnout, etc. But, you know, you are producing the world that you want to see when you have the creative embedded in this kind of political at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris. <coughs> um, that was really interesting um, point that you raised there, Judith, the whole play. Um, the and that I was thinking about was kind of backpedaling more towards the um, discussion previously had about freedom. Um, so for me, uh, again, I hate to bring pragmatism up again, but it's like you mentioned how you're hesitant to accept that term because of its like absolute connotation. Um, as in like people do have freedom um, and it's, it's kind of, um, a bit of a sidebar, but William James, who's like the pioneer of pragmatism, had sort of a uh, like a mental kind of breakdown after he finished his medical doctor's um, degree because he he basically wasn't able to reconcile the tension between determinism and free will, and pragmatism was his philosophical solution to that um, difficulty that was causing him like significant distress and kind of an inability to um enjoy his life um and to your point it's like this this burnout right um so anyway uh i think it's interesting because they, uh, i don't think there's absolute determinism or absolute free will it's probably somewhere in between those two extremes right and that that ever-changing um kind of balance it doesn't necessarily mean that the balance wherever it is between those two things that's not a fixed point either, right? Like it can oscillate and the pendulum can swing one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, I think. So, it, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you guys have said so many useful things today. I have so many good notes. I love Peter, what you just said, purity belongs entirely to the cops. That's so perfect. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, just all of these really great comments. I think what, the, like if I was to conglomerate this kind of conversation, what you guys have made me realize that's really blown my mind is that like through this pragmatism and through this like direct, like the, this really has to do with common sense. That's what you guys have made me realize today. Even though no one's used the terminology common sense, like what ties this all together, the pragmatism, the sort of direct um, thinking about theory in terms of tactics rather than in terms of ideas purely it all has to do with common sense. Like what you're saying about the pendulum, like that's, I mean, I'm really talking about like common sense in a philosophical sense, like in a very, in a very, you're, you know what, I'll just stop talking. I also, I think, <laughs> we, should, I think we should go back to, uh, we should probably like maybe wrap this up and go uh, back straight up to the SI for the last 40 minutes. But you guys have made me realize that there's this dimension of common sense that runs through this kind of work that is really interesting to me. And I also get a lot of common sense out of the SI. I don't like, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of unitary urbanism really has to do with like sensing in common and not necessarily, you know, needing to share every strain of critique, but to share a sort of vision of the world. And the connections of that to common sense via pragmatism have really, are blowing my mind right now. So anyways, that's what I'll be thinking about. But yeah, just thank you all for your feedback. This is really great. I have so many good notes. Um, and thank you for indulging me in this. Not, not a problem. Uh, yeah. Very much appreciated. It was a, a great presentation. I think all of us were, you know, had all kinds of ideas that we wanted to follow through with, uh, which is why I didn't want to sort of give it a, 
an absolute break, only 45 minutes. Clearly, it interests a lot of people for a variety of reasons, so each of us coming at it for our own you know, specific perspective. So at this point now, with what's left, what I'd like to do is sort of get some final thoughts from all of you on what your overview is of the SI, this group that starts, uh, well, really, it's, it's Debal. I mean, it's Debal's group each time because he's with the letterists for about a year or so. And by 1952, he's left them because he realizes there are limitations as to what they can do as he becomes more, I'm going to, have to use the word in quotation to radicalized, right? Becomes more political and politically aware. Starts the Letterist International. And uh, the book I just showed you there, um, Potlash, is basically all of his writings during this time period. You can see his thinking evolving and becoming more comprehensive, more complex, realizes that there are limitations with the, um, with the LI, and then that transforms into the situationist. And they, of course, start uh, early on with uh, unitary urbanism, with uh, detournement and psychogeography and derive. And of course, those things play out. And they continue to become radicalized as kind of revolution, revolution is in the air, right? Because now around the world, there are other uh, other areas are thinking along the same way. So he taps into this zeitgeist of re revolutionary thinking, which up until that point was just very kind of ephemeral. And of course, he become much more focused in on, uh, on trying to have workers councils or individuals thinking for themselves. And at one point, if he says, look, I don't need for you to have a comprehensive grasp of the SI. I just wanted to use, you know, use some of these ideas, like apply them in some way. Uh, and so we see the development of this group starting from, I guess, an aesthetic literary group to a more radicalized revolutionary uh, group that is sort of moving past Marxism and more towards uh, anarchism, especially the way that Emily has defined it today, because we see a lot of these ideas. So I just wanted to open the floor to final thoughts. And with this one in mind, this is, this is the one that's, you're going to go, what? Okay, so uh, when we think of the, the spectacle, right? The society of the spectacle and De Boer's insistence that the only way that we're going to change anything is we get hold of the modern tools, right? The modern tools of production, in this case, cultural production. So we need to get hold of media, uh, TV, radio, uh, all forms of broadcasting, cinema, in order to disrupt this thing from within and create this new world. For me, the only people that have managed to do this sadly enough, is the far right in the US. When you think about how people like Rush Limbaugh and the rest of these clowns for the, literally the last 30, 35 to 40 years have systematically done exactly what the SI was asking their followers to do, they've hijacked media. And they have basically spoon fed these people an alternate universe. And now we are, you know, we're feeling the effects of literally lying to people by having individuals begin to question uh, otherwise known as you know, authority figures, whether it is media itself, whether it is academics, um, it's a scientist, anyone that seems to have a, a firm position uh, on something, this, this group of Limbaugh and the rest of these clowns somehow have been able to take the tactics of the SI. And just like uh, we were talking earlier about how anarchy, is, uh, anarchy can exist on both ends of the, of the political spectrum, why is it, and again, elaborate, why is it that something very similar to what the SI were, were speaking about and discussing ended up being sort of, you know, uh, perfected by the far right? Yes, and Conway's, you know, alternative facts. Um, any ideas on trying to think through that? Because it's one that really drives me nuts because I thought, okay, well, you know, clearly these guys had something in mind. And instead, uh, you know, the enemy, they paid attention. They paid attention and then they learned. And he managed to, managed to subvert the possibility of disrupting this homogenous view from, from the inside. So uh, any thoughts at all on, on this? And then we can kind of segue into ideas about, about the SI and about the Society of the Spectacle, uh, starting with Judith. Yeah, um, I, I don't think we've done a lot of media analysis you know, in the course. And I also don't think that we, I don't think anyone did a presentation focused specifically on um, the SI's um, advice or like theoretical approach to mm -hmm. using media tools for political use. So 
um, I think there's an area there that we haven't really covered, but just in terms of thinking about, yeah. um, I guess, like right wing media in the States that you've raised and those examples that you've raised, those are, um, those really are, are prime and almost archetypal examples of propaganda. Like that's nothing but pure propaganda. You can yeah. literally watch four minutes of the, the, the Fox shows, any of the Fox shows pretty much, um, any time from the past decade at least. And it, it looks like almost like comically evil propaganda. That's what yeah. it is. Um, but if we're looking at a media landscape overall and the use of media tools for um, the promotion of a political agenda or for the um, signaling of some kind of politics, I think that you know a lot of our media overall, whether it's looking at these examples of explicit propaganda or just looking at like mm -hmm. movies, <laughs> movies that get made, um, media overall is um, such a, an insanely potent vehicle in our society for political messaging. And we have to include social media in that. So I wouldn't only, like I wouldn't want to jump just to the example of right-wing media. Obviously that's toxic and it's propagandistic and yeah. in North America and in Europe, um, we've seen the rise of right-wing extremism that we can link to propaganda. But at the same time, there is the underlying ongoing machinery of neoliberal capitalism that dominates our social structures and that itself is carried in the vehicles of media, mm -hmm. even if it's the CBC, even yep. just in how like the CBC covered COVID, for example, we could do a media analysis and see how that's inherently deeply political. So yeah, I just think that the SI is a good way of doing media analysis, like using that as a lens, but um, I think we can see that political being done in a lot of different media. Yeah, so I, I wanted to throw it out there to see if you had uh, similar thoughts because this notion of you know freedom or I don't want to use the freedom after after Emily's presentation, but um, the ability to to be heard, we'll say, by hijacking media these days, it seems to be infinitely more more difficult. Um, Peter, you have the solution, and you're going to tell us, right? <laughs> uh, no, I don't have a solution, but um, uh, but but I mean, I think I. I, I this this is either going to link to what I said earlier or be contradictory to it. Um, I think it's going to link to it somewhat nicely. Um, but I mean, I think I, I think part of the reason that like the right is so good at organizing and utilizing these tactics um, is because they often don't fall uh, prey to like purity spiraling. Um, and so what I, what I mean by that is like, is, 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 is like, you can have people who are fans of Rush Limbaugh who will be like tea partiers, uh, oath keepers, um, bore, like generic boring libertarians, et cetera. But if you try to join like um, an anarchist group in the US at least, there seems to be a very high level of partisanism. Um, and so, like, I mean, I mean, there in there, there are probably more, but there, but there's one relatively prolific bookstore here in Pittsburgh that's an anarchist bookstore with a list of things like "Do not enter if you're X Y Z A B C," running through a bunch of shit. And it's like, it's a great bookstore, but I'm like profoundly uncomfortable in there because it's just like you're more fascist than the fascists. <laughs> yeah. Like. Like, 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 I'm more comfortable, I would be more comfortable around, like, anyone else than you. Um, and, 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 and I think, and, and I think something that, like, the right has done really, really well is um, fostering a sense of inclusion, um, which the left has not been able to do. Um, because it's like, it's, 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 it's like you say one thing and like oh shit you're on the outs forever whereas the right's like i don't like 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 i don't I, I i don't care whatever come into our big tent and like there's surely some middle ground between those two but i think that like 
there's something very salient about that. Um, yeah. Well, it's it's almost to Emily's point. It's uh, you know, anarchists will spend six hours, uh, you know, over the minutia of a manifesto, and nothing gets done. And I I kind of think we're traveling down the same road here with with both yeah. points that uh, that the level of exclusion exclusionism on the left seems to be far more div divisive than it is on the right. I mean, we have you know we have people that uh, were interviewed like Trump supporters. Um, how do you feel about the fact that you know he's got all these uh, you know these these uh, lawsuits again against him with uh, sexual assault? Don't care. Don't care. That was that, that was that was the, the response. Don't care. So you're absolutely right, Peter, in how uh, um, inclusion or uh, inclusionary they can be, and overlook some of these slight differences. While on the left, they seem to be almost uh, divisive enough to destroy the group uh, as a whole. Now, I know with the SI, it was a, a something similar where uh, uh, Debo wanted to keep that that radical core, right, that ideological core in the center of the SI, even when they were claiming not to be ideological, mm -hmm. and yet he was turfing people out for exactly those reasons. So I think that could be a really early example of what you're talking about, you know, what's sitting outside that anarchist uh, bookstore. Uh, Paishini. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna try to rush through this because I don't wanna take up too much time, but uh, I just wanted to say to add to Peter's point and to respond to your question that it's also very interesting that uh, the kind of, you know, if, if you can, if I could say that uh, the SI is trying to uh, revise or perhaps contest some meta meta narratives that uh, are a legacy of enlightenment. Um, you can you could say you could almost say that the right now poses a challenge to those meta narratives in a much better way than, than the left ever has. Uh, for instance, I'll give you a very small example, which is that I mean, say the legacy of science or rationality. Mm -hmm. um, from from my country, for instance, I mean, we usually call these call these things conspiracy theories or irrational or unscientific. But the thing is that uh, the challenge that they pose to some of these hegemonies um, also take a form of post a post colonial resistance. Uh, and of course, I mean, it, it's still fascist nonetheless. But the point is that some of these some of these challenges that they that they pose to these hegemonies or these meta narratives, uh, they do a lot better than the left. Actually, mm -hmm. the left never does it, but yeah, I mean that's just an India. Yeah. Now, uh, the other thing that I've noticed too, it's in the media that we are amongst or or within these days is these these other ideas uh, get treated with a degree of seriousness that maybe you know at one point you say, look. <laughs> There's, it's right and wrong, right? There's, and at some point, uh, you can see, you know, news outlets like CNN, uh, literally bending over backwards to accommodate, you know, trying to look objective, by literally seriously talking about what what is what are, what are otherwise wacky ideas, and so the end result is that. I'm not really quite sure, like you're actually giving these ideas credence by discussing them in the first place, rather than saying, no, this is patently wrong. So to get back to, to the SI, like they, they really stress greatly that uh, we needed to get hold of uh, media because this was really where, where, the, where the messaging was, right? Uh, media in general. So the messaging was important for individuals to be able to, um, you know, to understand and, and grasp and say, okay, we need to detour, detour this in a different direction, offer alternatives, uh, offer possibilities to people, and at the very least, make them aware that they are even in this position in the first place. Many people didn't even realize that, you know, oh, what is this alienation? Uh, because when you have the Frankfurt School sitting discussing in an offhand way, you know we've 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 lost we've lost the war because now people just worry about saving up to buy a new motorcycle. They don't care about freedom and uh, and alienation. They just want to buy some new stuff. So I think the same thing was happening with the SI and this notion of of getting hold of media didn't quite work out the the way expected. Uh, Judith. Yeah, I just want to add for like thinking about this contextually that we are so far from whatever media landscape the SI was talking about and envisioning. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about media today and the kind of messaging that media projects today, we have to know that we're mostly talking about corporate mass media. Yeah. So these are like tools that are controlled by certain interests that are there to make profit, um, that are usually agglomerated into big companies. So um, we need to be careful about like 
trying to generalize the SI's lessons about media into our media today, because in a way, our media is already lost. There's no yeah. point in even trying to apply a sense of like, let's, let's take the media, let's take over the media messaging by like having a guest spot on CNBC and saying something exciting. That yeah. it means nothing and it's null and void. And as consumers of media today, someone in 2021, already has a certain frame through which they understand media messaging that gets projected at them that is related in part to the corporatization of media that does contain a certain degree of um, cynicism, like profound cynicism around media messaging. Mm. Most people here were raised on like, you know, a, a type of media that means they could never imagine forms of alternatives that the SI would have been considering. So I think we have to think of this contextually. Yeah, I, I, you're absolutely right, because I think they will come back and say, look, remember, remember what I told you about history, the movement of history, movement in history? You're absolutely right. I think perhaps the emphasis now would be uh, one, one character I think we find in SI writing, who is someone we still have today, is the passive consumer. I think uh, to, to remove the passive consumer, not make them necessarily active, but make them more critical, much more critical. Uh, and as a result, uh, be able to understand how media works, why it works, what is it, what is its message, what is it trying to do? And I'm just as I'm speaking, I'm trying to find the one book here. Um, I don't know if uh, you've, any of you have seen this one here, which is a commentary on the Society of the Spectacle. And just very briefly, uh, because I know uh, Chris has his hand up here. Uh, this is section five, and he, where he writes, the society whose modernization has reached the stage of integrated spectacle is characterized by the combined effects of five principal features, uh, technological renewal, integration of state and economy, generalized secrecy, unanswerable lies, and an eternal present. And then he breaks them all down. Uh, and he says, uh, the uh, section six, spectacular domination's first priority is to eradicate historical knowledge in general, beginning with just about all rational information and commentary of the most recent years. The more important something is, the more it is hidden. And so these, I think, could still speak to us today uh, in the sense that we will become more critical consumers, right? We're still consuming, but we perhaps will become more critical consumers because Judith, to your point, uh, we cannot sort of arbitrarily apply what they talked about in the mid sixties and the other side of the world to, in North America to 2021. The landscape looks totally different. I think that's the one lesson that we need to make sure that is, you know, is understood, but certainly the notion of the passive consumer, I think is a figure that we still have to, we still have to deal with. I think Chris wanted to say something. Well, actually, I, I could defer my um, time. <laughs> I, I saw you raise your hand in the middle of that discussion. It seemed like you were, unless you're okay with waiting. I just had one point about the media being like a truth thing now. So it, how can you leverage the media um, for revolution when we're in this like weird post post truth thing? But that's Oh, your microphone that just went off. Uh, yes, I think we are in that world of post-truth and uh, you know pushing emotional but buttons rather than giving people information. And we've been seeing it for years. A reporter comes up and you know asks of someone who's witnessed fire a fire or something, and the first question they ask is, "How do you feel?" Well, <laughs> don't you want to know what happened? But how do you feel? Like that that's where it starts. Um, Maxwell, you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, actually, on the exact same line. Um, since Emily brought up Peter Styles' work, I was thinking about uh, her text, Too Much World, Is the Internet Dead? Um, if I can just read a quick little bit, I think there's something useful here in thinking about the SI and, and the hangover of the SI in relation to media. She writes of the Romanian uprising in 1989 when protesters invaded TV studios to make history. Uh, at that moment, images changed their function. Broadcasts from occupied TV studios became active catalysts of events, not records or documents. Since then, it has become clear that images are not objective or subjective renditions of a pre-existing condition or merely treacherous appearances. They are rather nodes of energy and matter that migrate across different supports, shaping and affecting people, landscapes, politics, and social systems. 
they acquire an uncanny ability to proliferate, transform, and activate. Around 1989, television, television images started walking through screens right into reality. So the reason why I just wanted to read that is I think with the SI and the loss of the art object and the image and also its relation to post-structuralism and language, Starrell's picking up a number of years later in the 80s uh, retroactively as images become autonomous, they become an agent in their own right. Mm. Uh, and media is obviously very interwoven with that. So not to recognize that in terms of revolutionary processes, I think is a mistake. And I think that's pretty, not like, uh, like directly, slightly removed from the SI. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I think you're, you're right, Maxwell. That example in uh, Romania in 1989 was, a, again, a very fascinating one because other media outlets were focusing on what was happening there, but it was what was in that country itself. Suddenly, you know, the means of broadcasting information took on a completely different role. Uh, one that, of course, the SI would have applauded because it, it was motivating people. It was saying, you know, we're, we're here because, I mean, Romania had its secret police, uh, the Stasi and then uh, Ceausescu ran, you know, ran the place with an iron fist. So to suddenly see people speaking the truth must have been mind blowing, right? Here's what's going on. And people go out into the streets and that tipping point is well behind them all of a sudden. So it is one of these things where it's, uh, it's a series of historical conditions that need to be met before something that can happen that would have been sort of what the SI was talking about, but what happened in Romania, 1989, I think is a really, really good example of, of these images suddenly having a completely different function, or at least having the function that they required rather than just pacifying people, they were engaging them. Uh, it just hasn't happened that often, unfortunately. Um, any final thoughts from anyone else? I don't see anyone with their hand up. Oh, yes, Maxwell, to finish up. Uh, more just a general question of, um, I wanted to get a, a hard deadline for uh, the, the final paper. Okay, uh, I think the original deadline was April 11th. Does that sound right? Um, that doesn't sound right to me. Okay. I thought it was yesterday too. <laughs> oh, okay, so uh, it could have been yesterday. All right, um, all of us are busy. All of us are living these weird, you know, little strange things. And Judith, you just, you know, you're probably still recovering from your comps. Um, I'm willing to give people some time. So if you can get it to me, say in the next couple of weeks, uh, what would that be? Yay, it's, uh, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's say right now we're the eighth, it would have been the fourth. Uh, is the 18th too soon? Or would you like me to make it say by the 25th? The 18th uh, is a good starting point and the 25th oh. is a good ending point. <laughs> All right. For just once, we're going we're gonna to be temporal about this. Um, let's make it for the 25th. All right. If you can get it to me sooner, absolutely. Uh, but say if you can get it to me by the 25th without penalties, I'm cool with that. Uh, so the, that should give people uh, at least a couple of weeks. Uh, or a couple of extra weeks. As I say, if you if you are finished earlier, by all means, do uh, do submit it to the Dropbox. But if not, if we can wrap this up by say the twenty fifth, that would be ideal because uh, I think I'm not even supposed to tell anybody, but my marks don't have to be in until the tenth of May. Okay, see, and we are getting recorded. I'm in big trouble. So. <laughs> um, that's, that's kind of the way it is. So if you can get it to me by the 25th, as soon as they do come in, I'll be reading them right away. But let's make it the 25th for kind of the last deadline. Now, does that work generally for everyone, uh, Maxwell and Judith and everyone else? And because like I say, all of you are marking papers, you're all working as TAs in this weird thing that we're <laughs> called pandemic world. Um, you realize that about a year from now, when I hopefully we're all back together, people are going to go, well, how did you do it? You know, this was weird. Um, you're going to miss wearing masks. No, we're not. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's make it the 25th. I will go in after and I'm going to uh, reopen the Dropbox uh, for it to be available till the 25th of April. Uh, done earlier, by all means, uh, submit it. Uh, but I will finish up now. We have all the presentations. I have all the short papers as well. I'm going to finish all of that. Uh, basically attendance and all the rest of it uh, should be should be good. And uh, that's kind of it. This is the part I don't like where we kind of say bye for the last time. So thank you everybody for for joining us. Oh, oh Emily, you want to say something? Wait, I'm sorry.
I have a question for you. Um, sure. Oh, okay. I'm wondering about as you're writing your book, or I think you're you're in the editing phase. I'm wondering if any of your ideas for your book have like evolved in the course of this class and talking through this um, this reading with us. And I'm just curious about that. Has anything shifted, or you know? Well, you know, if, uh, here's here's what has happened. Uh, it's given me a chance to go back and clarify a lot of ideas that I initially presented. Um, mm -hmm. My reader asked me to sort of move things around, which is not saying a rewrite. It's just you know it's structure but yeah. I've had a chance to sort of clarify some things and really be much more specific and a little bit critical at times yeah. um, but what has happened though is we've gone through and we've taught at least in my mind a lot more about language and uh, Judith your presentation last week kind of solidified it for me that I'm going to take another run at these folks but look at it very specifically from the issue of language and how it relates to the spectacle how it relates to to the symbolic um, as a matter of fact I don't know if you remember the uh, the Feb um, chapter. Now I've got a copy of this book here, uh, Language and Society. Um, another book. This is from uh, Meshonik, the uh, Barbarism, um, and another book too, which means I'm going to be continuing to read is this one here, which is another book, which is Essays on the Situationists. Um, there it is. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, Alistair Hemden, and so it's on the SI. So short answer, yes. Uh, it, it did. Uh, but what I'm going to be doing is, is um, sort of now that the, the, the writing is done, it's been sent off, it's going to be uh, published in August. Um, and I'm just really fine tuning stuff. But yeah, it's given me a chance to go back because I've had to do the rewrites anyway. So what it's done is given me a chance to just clarify my, my thoughts. And you guys get a shout out in the acknowledgements. Um, and so you're there. Uh, but yeah, I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to present this material to you. But at the same time, to, for all of you to have a chance to engage with this, uh, with this stuff. And I know we didn't really talk a lot about Society of the Spectacle. It is an important text. But I think each of you found, you know, some, some nuggets, some little, uh, some, you know, chunks of information that caught your eye, you know, whether it have to be on, on language or anarchy or, you know, basic banalities. Um, they had a lot of different uh, ideas. And it was not necessarily scattershot. It was, uh, it was trying to be as concise as possible, but they also wished to be comprehensive. So it's this weird paradox of being really sort of laser focused on specific things and yet being comprehensive at the same time. And we did not have a chance to talk about education and Parashini, you will get the last word because we talked via email about the idea of the, um, on the poverty of student life. And it, it was a, an awful paper and we talk back and forth about how the changes are now with more of a uh, interdisciplinary kind of uh, education rather than what they faced in France, which is basically pumping out accountants, right? Yeah. You know, uh, pumping out people that are going to continue the system. So Payushini, you get the last word. Uh, just some, some, just a couple of ideas that you wanted to present. I, I really don't know what to say, right? All I wanted to say uh, to Dr. Matthews at that point was that uh, there's, I mean, we don't really have that kind of a poverty. I'm not assuming that any of you are not poor, but um, I kind of am. But all, all I wanted to say was that um, just as there is this abundance of resources and stuff and opportunities, there's a poverty of opportunity and resistance. And this is not to say, this is not to say that uh, there's no resistance. It's just that the kind of, power structures we're operating with now in the neoliberal university or neoliberal nation. Um, yeah, I mean, resistance just has a completely different manifestation. That, that's all I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. But anyone wants to add to that? It's true, uh, because virtually all the things we discuss, student life, um, corporate media, uh, things look really different to us now. But I think there is enough uh, in the SI's writings that we can sort of, we can pick and choose the things that are still historically relevant and that we can apply to our thinking. And certainly the notion of psychogeography is, uh, is ongoing. We see people, you know, engaging that even now, uh, the derive as well. Uh, the Tour de Ma is something that is really perennial because when you think about it, it was originally written in 1860 by uh, Lautre and this idea of, you know, um, turning something on its head to get it to tell the truth. Uh, this idea is a strategy that can be used 
any number of, of different ways. Although I would say the memes on Facebook are kind of weak versions of this, this kind of stuff. Uh, but I, I thought uh, uh, Emily's presentation, having anarchists dressed up as police officers, I mean, that is a wonderful detournement, the, the whole point, right, of what people look like, just the, that, you know, the, the sheer force of having a whole, you know, phalanx of these guys looking the same way. And instead, they're, they're firing off teddy bears. So again, it undercuts, you know, that the, the, the brutality of the image is undercut by the by what they're doing. So I think that was that, that SI moment that I thought was very, uh, very appropriate. Um, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you again very much. Uh, if you see me, maybe not wandering the hallways anytime soon at <laughs> Western, but maybe downtown uh, at your nearest record store, perhaps, or uh, Attic Books, uh, which is where I'm going to be. Uh, everyone, thank you so much and take care. And we shall hopefully see each other soon. Bye-bye.